Were you going to say anything? Okay, just, I don't want to fight over the mic there. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Let's give Heather, she is an amazing area director, and it was a joy. We did, we, get to, we got to spend all day Saturday together as a team, which doesn't happen very often, and it was really fun, and um, Heather prays for us and encourages us in so many ways, so we are so blessed to have her as our leader and in our class. Okay, y'all, give me a second to get set up. And yes, if you haven't seen the kiddos yet today, um, they are talking about John the Baptist. They've been doing, they did a cute little uh, white dove, little craft, and their aim is, they're talking today about how Jesus wants them to prepare their hearts for Jesus, which isn't that our prayer for all our loved ones. Well, thank you for that prayer, Heather, but let me, before I begin our teaching, let me open us up in prayer. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and that you are the true source of wisdom and insight. Thank you for your word, for the ministry of CVS and this sacred space where we can come together and learn more about you and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all. Well, in the book, A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Vonken, there is a story of two dogs who lived in the country. They had the ideal country dog setting, beautiful rolling hills, lots of sunshine, and a good master who loved them. It was the kind of life you would love, you know, if you were a dog. Gypsy was an older dog and Snowball the younger. Every day about the same time, their master called them in for dinner. They knew to obey, which meant they had to respond as soon as they heard their master's call. One day at the exact moment he called them, Gypsy, Snowball, dinner time, a rabbit ran across Gypsy's path. Suddenly, she felt a strange sensation. She wanted to ignore her master and chase that rabbit. She was so tempted, but she yielded to what she knew was right and went to dinner anyways. But the next day, it happened again, and this time she gave in to temptation. She heard her master's voice, but she decided she just wanted to chase that rabbit. And when she finally came to dinner, she came with her tail between her legs. She knew she had done wrong and didn't want to do it again, but she did it again and again until it became easier for her to do. Soon, young Snowball was able to run free while Gypsy was now leashed. Her master was heartbroken. He loved her, but he knew he couldn't trust her anymore. One day, the master loaded his dogs into the car to take them for a walk in the woods. But when they arrived, Gypsy, now used to disobeying, took off before the master could put his leash on her. And she ran and ran and ran into those woods. He kept calling her name desperately, Gypsy, Gypsy, in hopes that she would return to him. He and Snowball searched for hours, but for Gypsy, his voice became more distant until she couldn't hear him anymore. Meanwhile, Gypsy's master, who loved her so, cried as the sun was going down, put Snowball back in his car and drove home. He never saw Gypsy again. You know, I can't help but wonder if David had any idea that when Absalom made that request to go to Hebron, that that was going to be the last time that he would see his son. At this low point in David's life, it's hard to see that a parent's mistakes are often reflected, if not amplified, ouch, in the lives of their children. God had predicted through the prophet Nathan that David's family would suffer because of his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. And even though God had forgiven David, we are continuing to witness the ugly consequences of David's sin, especially with Absalom, who took vengeance upon Amnon for the rape of Tamar. Sadly, the taste and lure of rebellion only set in further as Absalom began to campaign against his father and shrewdly won over the people of Israel. With a hardened heart towards his father, Absalom was intent to take the throne at any cost to gain power and prestige. David must have been horrified to see his son's selfish 
desires run wild. Yet David knew all too well what it was like to be a man who had fallen into rebellion. He knew deep down inside that his lack of obedience to God's word and spiritual leadership in his family had caused the demise. However, there is a difference between David and Absalom. David is God's chosen and anointed servant who, whose humility and repentance brought him back into God's favor as Absalom's pride and vanity only grew as he just kept on sinning. Through hardships, David has learned that submission to God's will brings restoration. But in today's lesson, we see with Absalom how rebellion against God's anointed king brings death. Amongst having a wicked son, being exiled out of Jerusalem, and unexpectedly being betrayed by the closest of advisors, we can only imagine the depth of David's sorrow. As chapter 15 ended last week, God was gracious to hear David's prayer and provide Hushai, who not, who not only met David in his grief, but was willing to return to Jerusalem, you know, under false pretenses. As Hushai agreed to provide, you know, insider information to David, there is a flicker of hope as the last verse from chapter 15 states, so David's friend Hushai returned to Jerusalem, getting there just as Absalom arrived. Can't you just feel the tension in the air? Well, before we jump right into today's homework, I do want to share today's central idea for the teaching, which is rebellion brings death but submission to God brings restoration. And your three chapter segments are provided on the screen for you. All right, well, as we open our Bibles to chapter 16, we see right away that a crafty opportunist comes to David. What outwardly appears to be a gracious gesture ends up unknowingly creating a problem that will not be fixed until after David recaptures his throne. David knew Ziba because he was the servant of Jonathan's crippled son. And after providing David with generous amounts of donkeys, bread, wine, and fruit, Ziba tells David that Mephibosheth was back in Jerusalem waiting to take back the kingdom of his grandfather Saul, you know, after David and Absalom would just pretty much ruin each other. This lie told by Ziba won't come to light until later when it is then realized that Ziba purposely left Mephibosheth behind to make it look as if he was not supporting David. With the pains of betrayal still raw, David was too quick to assume that Ziba was telling the truth, ends up making a rash judgment that gave Ziba exactly what he wanted, which was the property that belonged to Mephibosheth. Sadly, Ziba took advantage of David, using this time of crisis in David's life for his own selfish benefit. And unfortunately for David, even more opposition comes as he and his men begin approaching um, Baharim. Shimei was that distant relative of King Saul, a man who resented David for replacing Saul's kingdom. His intent was to accuse and destroy any shred of dignity or confidence that David had left because he personally blamed David for the death of Saul and his sons. As Shimei was on the hillside opposite David, it was easy for him to curse, throw stones and clumps of dirt at David. Shimei had his heart set against the Lord's anointed for a long time taking complete advantage of when David was down and out. I mean, isn't that just like our enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy? Yet there is something to take note of here because we see that David did not retaliate. He did not close his ears to unpleasant words. Actually, David was willing to listen to what God might be trying to say to him through a cursing critic because just maybe David had been brought to that place of brokenness, which so often is necessary in order that we might enter into that place of complete and total submission unto the will of God. You know, that place which says, whatever you want, God, let it be so. 
Through Ziba's lies, Satan attacked David as a serpent who deceives. And through Shimei's words and stone throwing, Satan came as a lion who devours. But David, he made the choice not to let the, his wicked opponents distract him from the current situation at hand. David may have temporarily lost the throne, but by submitting himself to David's will and refusing to cling to his rights, does David not portray to us a picture of Christ? Listen to the words of Philippians 2, which says, Who being in the form of God did not consider himself to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of a cross. Okay, well, does anyone remember the Carly Simon song, You're So Vain? <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe it was the rain or getting a little stir crazy, but that one got stuck in my head this week, so I had a little fun changing the lyrics because, yes, Absalom, you are so vain, and pretty much most of this teaching is going to be all about you. All right, well, we know that Absalom was trusting in his charm, his popularity, his luxurious, gorgeous long hair, as well as the wisdom of Ahithophel. Yet David, what was he doing? He was trusting in his Lord. And his plan to send Hushai as a spy to Absalom worked because not only did it play into Absalom's pride and ego, but most importantly, it was because the Lord was going before them. There is no doubt that Absalom loved the idea of having more counselors at his fingertips. The time had come to seize his father's throne and let it be known to all of Israel that he was officially the king. And rather than seeking God for himself, Absalom looked at Ahithophel, who suggested that Absalom go in and sleep with his father's concubines. Well, Ahithophel believed this bold action would give courage to Absalom's followers because doing this act was so disgraceful and offensive to David that it would eliminate any possibility of reconciliation between David and Absalom. Besides, it was customary for a new king to inherit a previous king's wives and harem. And as supportive as Ahithophel may have outwardly seemed to suggest this act, it is likely that one of his secret goals was revenge against David for the sin he had committed against his granddaughter Bathsheba and Uriah. Yet, unknowingly, even to the wisest of wise Ahithophel, he was actually fulfilling Nathan's prophecy back from chapter 12, which said, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you. And he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight before all of Israel. Those are bone chilling words. And yet they came to be. David was on the roof of his house when he first lusted after Bathsheba. And sadly, this is where David's concubines were taken and violated by his own son. Absalom was so enraged when his brother Adnan for raping Tamar, yet Absalom doesn't even hesitate to rape 10 of his very own father's wives. That is the depth of Absalom's wickedness and willingness to obtain power. Again, at no time does he seek God for wisdom. Rather, he put his trust in the advice of a bitter man who had a score to settle. But God, in his sovereignty, used it to fulfill his word to David because rebellion brings death, but submission to God brings restoration. Well, Absalom's obsession for obtaining the throne was now that much closer at hand. The only thing left in his way is David himself. So Absalom turns once again to Ahithophel for advice. We know that Ahithophel's plan was smart. It had a high probability of success, not to mention it would spare Israel from a massive civil war. 
Ahithophel suggested an immediate attack because David and his men would have been weak and weary with himself leading the 12,000 men being the one to kill David. And as much as Ahithophel would want Absalom to believe he was striking down David out of loyalty to him, it's more likely that Ahithophel just wanted to kill David because of the sin against Bathsheba. Now, this plan would have been a win-win for both of them and was received well by all the elders. But David had what? He had prayed to God that he would turn Ahithophel's counsel to foolishness. And we know that the instrument God used to help make this happen was Hushai who very wisely took a completely different approach by focusing on the ego of Absalom and doing whatever he could to buy David more time. One of the first things he does is to play into Absalom's fears by speaking of David's military strength because everyone knew that David's army was experienced, that they were angry men who had been driven from their homes. Therefore, a sudden attack would not necessarily work. And so if word had spread throughout Israel that Absalom's forces were being defeated, would not all his men lose heart and his reign be over? Hushai then suggested that all Israel from Dan to Beersheba would be gathered to Absalom with Absalom leading the way so he could prove to all that he was as a mighty and victorious soldier, you know, just like his dad, even if not more. Besides, with such a massive army at his command, Absalom wouldn't even have to you know, wouldn't even have to depend on a, on a surprise tact. They would just fall on David's men over this wide area, just wiping them out. This grand plan, punctuated with vivid mental pictures, gripped Absalom's mind and heart, while Ahithophel's matter-of-fact speech was most likely already forgotten about as God did what? He faithfully answers David's prayer. Verse 14 told us that it was the Lord who had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to what? To bring disaster on Absalom. And why was this? Because rebellion brings death, but submission to God brings restoration. Friends, may we never forget the power of prayer and the people God brings into our lives to help us during our times of need. As believers, we too are the Lord's anointed. That means God hears our cries, he goes before us, and he is willing to intervene on our behalf. Now, knowing that time was of the essence, Hushai communicates his and Ahithophel's counsel to Zadok and Abathar, the priests in Jerusalem, who then send their sons to inform David that he must cross the river immediately. But again, opposition arises as the two young men were spotted and their whereabouts were reported to Absalom, you know, by some nosy tattletales that clearly had nothing better to do. Well, much like the story of Rahab who hid two spies on her roof for safety, scripture tells us that as Jonathan and Ahimaaz quickly ran to a house in Ber um, Baharim, the wife hides the boys in their dried up well. And when Absalom's men approach her asking if she had seen the boys, she courageously sends them off in the wrong direction. God used this woman to protect the boys as they were then able to escape just in time to reach David, who took their instructions to heart, crossed the river that night, and found refuge in Manaham. Now, it's possible David chose this location because it was a fortified city. And also, if you remember, it was the former capital of the ten tribes when, son, when Saul's son Ishbosheth was king. Manaham, which means two camps, two hosts, is also the place where Jacob saw an army of angels as God sent to encourage him back in Genesis 32. And just like for David, God was again faithfully providing for his servant David through an army of people. What a picture of extravagant grace and love as Shobi, 
Makura, and Barzillai, then brought an abundance of provisions to David and his people and saw to it that they were adequately cared for before the battle began. How beautiful are the words of Psalms 23, 5, which says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. In his loving kindness, God did just that. He prepared a table for David while the enemies were approaching. How that must have encouraged his heart. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Ahithophel realized with the rejection of his counsel that God was still very much with David. Ahithophel was serving the wrong king. Therefore, he knew defeat would be inevitable for the one who comes against the Lord's anointed. And rather than succumbing to the consequences of being a traitor or repenting of his sins, he took matters into his own hands much like Saul who fell on his sword and Judas. And we know that Ahithophel hung himself because rebellion brings death, but submission to God brings restoration. Now, after this time, a sweet refreshment provided for the Lord. David strategically numbers his troops, dividing them into three companies. David, who is most likely 60 years of age at this time, offered to accompany his army into battle. Maybe he didn't want to re repeat his previous mistake of not going into battle when he should have. Well, regardless of his intent, David told, men told him to stay behind because they knew that Absalom's soldiers would go directly after the king. And they said to him, you are worth 10,000 of us. I thought that was so precious. Well, they suggested for David to stay in the city so he could better assist them by sending out reinforcements if needed. But I also believe God was being incredibly gracious to David because by not going into battle, he was being shielded from having to draw his sword against his own son. How could we forget that Absalom stood at the city gates politicizing against his father? And now David stood by the gates as and was instructing the soldiers not to harm his son as they began their march into the fields to fight Israel. Quite frankly, y'all, it's heartbreaking to think about how many people were actually seduced and won over by Absalom's charm and empty promises. And it's even more sad to think how David was having to fight against the army of Israel. After all, he had been their victorious and mighty leader for years, but the army of Israel had also submitted to the wrong king, and they too have rebelled against the Lord's anointed leader, and judgment came swiftly upon them as God allowed the forest of Ephraim to devour them. Now, we really don't know exactly how the forest devoured them, but what we do know is that God has used nature in the past to bring judgment. In Genesis 6, God sent rain and flooded the earth for the wickedness of man. In number 16, when Korah and his friends rebelled against Moses, God opened the ground and the people were swallowed up. In Joshua 10, hailstones were hurled down on the Amorite army. And rather than using lightning or thunder and quaking of the earth, we see that God uses what? Hmm, a single branch from a tree to humble vain Absalom. I mean, can't you just envision him, almost Fabio-like, with his long hair flowing, his chest all puffed out, ready to lead his troops in battle, only to get suspended in a tree as his thick hair gets him all entangled, and then his mule keeps going along. How ironic that the thing that he was so proud of turned out to be a stumbling block that assisted in his death. And as humorous as this is, let it also be a warning to us because as Christ's followers, we must be willing to humble ourselves before the Lord and ask him to show us if there are any idols or entanglements in our own lives. And if so, we need to be honest with ourselves. 
honest before our God so that they will not lead us away. Now the soldier who encountered Absalom hanging from the tree did not dare touch him out of respect for David's request. He would gladly, oh, but Joab, as we know, doesn't even hesitate and takes matters into his own hands, doesn't he? He would gladly give money and a promotion to anyone who killed Absalom because he was convinced that it was in David's best interest as well as in the nation of Israel's best interest to show Absalom no mercy. Here is a quote from Morgan's commentary that I thought was really good. Absalom only received what he deserved. He was a murderer, a traitor, and a rapist. Joab knew that David was generally indulgent towards his children and would never punish Absalom. He had seen David's action towards his son characterized by a lack of discipline in the highest interest of the kingdom. His hand was raised to slay Absalom. We know that Joab wasted no time, thrust three javelins into Absalom as ten men who bore Joab's armor, perhaps one for each of the ten concubines, then made sure that he was dead. And there certainly would be no memorializing of this wicked rebel rather than he was cast into a great pit. Joab made sure he would receive absolutely no glory nor be an inspiration for others to follow suit. With the trumpet blown, the war was, was over, but now it was time to tell David the bittersweet news. Ahimeaz most likely didn't realize what he was asking when he asked Joab if he could be the one to deliver the news to David. Joab knew this report of Absalom's death would need to be conveyed skillfully. After all, David was known to take out his anger on messengers, such as he had with the all-too-eager men who brought the news of Saul, Jonathan, and Ishbosheth's deaths. So in an effort to keep him safe, Joab assigned the Cushite with the task, um, because it would have been better, I guess, for a foreign servant to be slain than the son of a priest. But in his persistence, Ahimeaz ends up being allowed to go. As David is seated by the gates of the city, eagerly waiting for the watchman of the tower to give word um, that the messenger is on his way, and may he, Ahimeaz arrives first and yells out, all is well. But when David specifically asks about Absalom, he is unprepared to answer the king. He makes up an excuse and ends up being told to step aside as the Cushite then arrives and was the one to answer the question. Y'all, may we be a people who is prepared before our Heavenly Father. May we be a people who will not hesitate or make excuses as to whom is the Lord of our lives. How I pray that we will be able to say with full confidence that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior, that he is the only one that sits on the throne of our hearts, and that salvation and eternal life is in no other name. David weeps and trembles as he learns that Absalom is dead. No doubt he prayed that the worst would not happen to his son, but it happened just the same. Here are some words from Charles Spurgeon who said, Our children may plunge into the worst of sins, but they are our children still. They may scoff at our God. They may tear our hearts to pieces with their wickedness. We cannot take complacency in them, but at the same time, we cannot unchild them or erase their image from our hearts. David's deep grief reveals the broken heart of a loving father. David had wept when he heard about the death of Jonathan and Saul, as well as over the murder of Abner and Ishbosheth. So why would he not mourn over the death of his own son? Once again, the heart of God is revealed in the heart of David. For Christ died for us when we were sinners and living as enemies of God. David would have died for Absalom, but Jesus did die for us. In gratitude for the cross, we should be so thankful that God has not dealt with us according to our sin. In his grace, he gives us what we don't deserve. <clears throat> 
And in his mercy, he doesn't give us what we do deserve. Jesus didn't deserve to die. He was sinless. Yet he took the punishment that belongs to each of us. Like the two dogs, Gypsy and Snowball, we too have a choice whom our master will be. Just as there could only be one king of Israel, there can only be one king of our hearts. Will we fully surrender, trusting in God's best for us? Will we obey his word and instructions, laying down temptations, idols, and distractions to follow his commands? Will you, will I allow God's grace and mercy to restore us as we submit to him in all things? Let's pray. Oh, oh, Father, how could we ever forget the magnitude of your love for us? May we choose for this day in whom we will serve. May our hearts be fully devoted to the one who laid down his life so that we could live completely forgiven, restored, and redeemed. Thank you, God, for your father heart towards us. May the truth of your word refresh and revive us today. And as we depart from this place, May we expend, extend your grace and mercy to those who are in need. In Jesus' precious name, amen.